Good afternoon. Welcome to session five of European Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Stanford Engineering School. My name is Burton Lee. Today is February 8th, and we're very pleased to be featuring two speakers from Berlin and Macedonia. Our first speaker from Macedonia will tell you a bit more about Macedonia. Uh, women's Health Startups and Balkan Startup Accelerators are the topics of today's talks. Uh, these are also two really interesting, very impressive women founders out of different, very different parts of Europe. Uh, Ida is actually Danish, but living in Berlin, based clue in Berlin, and Irena is out of Skopje. I've never been to Macedonia, uh, but I think you'll enjoy hearing about what's going on there today. And then uh, our free speaker here, actually, Ida, will be talking about this really interesting new company she and her team are building out of Berlin, which is going viral, has shown very, very strong growth in just the last couple of months. It's very exciting. Uh, also very, very strong design focus, uh, which is important for attracting users. I think it'll be particularly important for those of you interested in women's, women's health. And they're based out of Berlin, uh, but also based here in the Bay Area as well. Um, so so uh, let's give a warm welcome to Ida, who's come all the way from Berlin to be with us here today. Thank you, Ida. Um, it's available in 11 languages, it's used in 180 countries, it's on iOS, Android, and Apple Watch. So why do women use a product like this? We find that people have really a ton of different reasons to use it. Some use it because they want to know when the next period is coming. They just want to get an alert saying, hey, it's coming up in two days, they know to go and buy whatever they buy. But we find that people, when they use it for a while, they start understanding things about their bodies that they didn't understand before. And I think that is very profound that people start learning what is going on, and it makes them live better with their cycle, with their cycles, which is something which is a really <coughs> central part of our lives. Um, and in fact, these kind of apps is the second biggest category in health apps. It's really huge. And I think it speaks to the fact that they are serving a real need. Right? It's something that it's not a it's not gonna for fun. <laughs> it's something we do because it's an important part of our life, and we need to somehow understand what the heck is going on. And what's so amazing about working in this field is that it's it's so universal, right? It's really for half of this generation. For 40 years of their lives, and even a little bit before you start having your first period to till after you've had your last period. And it doesn't really matter whether you know, you're know you women to the left or the women to the right, it's something that you have to manage in some capacity. And I wanna say, female health 
is not a niche market. Female health is massive. In fact, it's really big business. So here in the, in the States, two thirds of all public healthcare spending goes to things related to women's health. Two thirds. And that's two thirds of two and a half trillion. Trillion? Trillion. So there are an immense, it's an immense part of life. You use services, you have things going on, and you have a huge emotional part of your life also related to these things because it affects or it, it kind of influences our, our identity, our sexuality, big choices that we make in life about having children or not having children or trying to have children and not succeeding, like all these things. So it's also a very emotional part of life on top of being a very big business. And on a side note, note um, which might be interesting to you who are interested in entrepreneurship, only 5% of venture capital goes towards female health. So there's a huge opportunity, <laughs> definitely. So um, we have partnered with a couple of, well, a handful of universities, really great universities, Stanford being one of them, which we're really, really proud and happy about. Um, because what we have now is a completely, really revolutionizing tool for researchers to understand what's going on related to the cycle and to female health. Because the data set we have are, of course, magnitudes bigger than what researchers had access to before. And we want to make sure that whenever we learn something, and we learn something together with our scientific partners, that we feed that right back to the users as fast as we can. So, one of the reasons why I get really excited about collecting data about this part of life is because we can not only provide insights for the individual, but we can also kind of educate the world about this part of life. And in the end, I think it's really about empowering women, and it's about including men into that conversation about this part of life, which in the end, I think, also empowers men. So this is how Clue started. <coughs> a bunch of post-it notes on a wall. Um, this is literally my bedroom. It's a bedroom wall in 2009. And I want to just spend a little bit of time telling you kind of my story. Why, why did I start Clue? So I had um, tried to be on the pill when I was in my early 20s. I had a bunch of side effects. It really didn't work out that well for me. Um, so I was in state of relationships all of my 20s, so I had, you know, use condoms, but you don't really use them maybe perfect, and you come to the end of your cycle and you're like, oh, I hope I didn't get pregnant, um, pregnant, and, and also did have an abortion at some point. So at the end, I was like, you know, why, why is this so difficult? <laughs> you know, um, I was thinking, like, why has, there no, why has there been no great innovation in the space of family planning since the pill came out in the 50s? I mean, Light years away, right? It's 70 years ago. What great innovation has been made? I looked into lots of patent databases and everything was about putting hormones into the body in some capacity or, or men's body. And I was like, that's crazy. You just have to know like, where you are in your cycle and you would know to use a condom on some specific days. Boom, you would have a data-driven alternative to the pill. That's how I started. <laughs> so, and I still have the ambition, and we're not there yet. This is not a contraceptive. I want to say that really clearly. Clue is not a way to not get pregnant. Yes, but we are getting there. <laughs> so, it's kind of in brackets, I'm a really odd person to try and revolutionize female health. This is me. <laughs> um, and this is what my life looked like before I started Clue. Um, I had this idea to see if I could use the deserts of America as my office. Um, so I brought, I brought a satellite device and my, my laptop and my, my, my tent and my motorcycle. Um, and it was great. It was, it was awesome. I did it for two years and uh, it was kind of crazy, but it was fun. Um, and I ran a motorcycle touring company. I had a motorcycle touring company that I had with my dad for five years. So we did tours all over the world. So I would fly out to Mongolia, do a tour, and then go back to my tent. It was fun. Um, I wrote a book about it that became a little bestseller in Denmark. Um, yeah, so that was my life before Clue. So you can definitely change industries, that's for sure. 
this is how I grew up. I, I traveled the world on motorcycles with my parents since I was one year old. Um, and then my, I want to say a little bit about education as well because I've had a really weird educational history. <laughs> I've kind of actually really curated my own education since I was 14. I was thinking about that yesterday. I was like, I really want to surprise myself. I, I didn't go to university. I went to a very creative business school called the Chaos Pilots in Denmark, which is this crazy fun international kind of entrepreneurial school. And actually what it's really about is design thinking, but we didn't have that word. It kind of started before that was there. So it's kind of a mix between design thinking and entrepreneurship. It was a lot of fun. I did that for three years. Um, and then I had a very <coughs> short encounter with university in Berlin. And I was like, no, I just want to build Clue. That's what I want to do. <laughs> so I dropped out. So why did I start in Berlin? It could have been really honestly anywhere. Um, I started because it's a, it's a pretty cool city. It really is. <laughs> it's really vibrant. Um, there is definitely a growing ecosystem for, um, for startups. It's still really young. I mean, sometimes we compare it to like a new forest versus old growth forest that you have here. It's, it's still young, but it's, but it's growing. And it's fun being part of something that's kind of what's happening in the city. And it's, it's, um, it's coming up. There are like crazy events like this, which is, you know, accessible and kind of um, lighthearted, if you like, in some sense. Um, I think Berlin still has a little bit of this innocent maker energy. You know, people tinker something, would tinker, tinker with something, they build something, they try it out. It's not really a, like a very kind of dedicated career choice and people are kind of unprofessional in some sense often. But it's, it's fun, it's fun. Um, and it's still cheap, it's a cheap city, which is really cool. I mean, God, it's expensive here. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and then it's a really livable city. I don't want to make it like a commercial for Berlin, but it's really green and it's, it's just, it's kind of slow in some sense, but it can be quite nice. <laughs> um, so, when we are in Berlin, we really have to go out of Berlin to learn. So we do that a lot. So we'll come here, we'll go to London, we'll go to New York, we'll go where, where there are people that have built stuff before and done things that we're trying to figure out how to do. So that is really important to say. We can be in Berlin, but we need to go out to learn. Um, yeah. This is some of our team members. Aren't they cool? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so we have hired people from all over the world to come to Berlin, even out of Silicon Valley, would you believe it? Which is really great that we can do that. We'd like to think it's because of Clue, but it might also have something to do with being in Berlin. <laughs> um, so we did some stats on our diversity the other day, so it's kind of for fun. Uh, and it turned out that we are um, from, so we're 25 people, I think, or no, actually we're 27 people since I left last week. 27 people, um, we're from five different continents, 17 countries. We have uh, the youngest one being 20, the older ones being 60. We are anything from straight to transgender and anything in between and people who don't even want to have a label, <laughs> which is totally fine. Um, and we are expecting to grow to about 40 people this year. So, okay, disclaimer, here comes the breaking part. So bear with me, but I think um, we are in Silicon Valley, I'm kind of trying to put on this kind of you know, American like here, this is how cool we are. So this is, okay, so we are the fastest growing app in our category. Um, so just to give you a sense of our growth, so we had um, in 2014 December, we had about 150,000 downloads for that month. Um, so for the month of December was 150, and for the month of January of this year, we had 1 million downloads. So with our download, download curves going in a very nice direction, which is cool. Um, we raise money from Union Square Ventures, who are um, early investors in Twitter and Foursquare and Stack Overflow and other really cool companies. So that's awesome. They're really nice. And also Mosaic in London, they're very nice. We raised seven million. We have raised $10 million till date. Um, we've been covered by a lot of media. BBC did a four or five minutes kind of commercial about Clue, which was really cool. We were so stoked when we said, like, really, guys? Thank you. That was really nice. Um, but we've been covered in BuzzFeed, New York Times, Wired, uh, TechCrunch, lots of different things, Bloomberg business. 
And I even won an award. This is I won the Female Web Entrepreneur of the Year uh, in the uh, European Union by the European Union. Um, and here I'm on stage receiving the award in Helsinki, and I, of course, very humble and grateful to receive this. But I also like, could you just leave that word female out? That would be so much cooler. <laughs> and um, I kind of get that maybe we need that right now to kind of promote that or inspire more women to start businesses. But really, I mean, I just want to be a cool entrepreneur and not a cool female entrepreneur. You know, there was a guy behind the stage together with me. He was also going to um, win an award. And he's like, oh, you got the girl prize. Yeah, I got the girl prize. Cool. How cool is that? It's not really cool. I just want to... Anyway. <laughs> Still, thank you. I mean, <laughs> So, um, we were also named what... Peter, who was, who was the gentleman next to you? I mean, so that's where it gets like, why do you have to ask that? <laughs> I, he, he was the European Commissioner of something I don't remember. <laughs> do you know? <laughs> Sorry. I, I can't <laughs> um, yeah, so we were named uh, Best of Apps, both in the App Store and the Play Store last year, which was a great recognition for the team. It's really nice. Um, Okay, that was the bragging part. Now you can relax again. So, what I really want to do is to help women understand what's going on in their bodies and to be in charge of their reproductive health. And in the end, it's really about empowering women. It's really what it is. Because I believe that when you know what's going on and you understand that important part of life, you can make good choices for yourself and you can stay healthy. I think that's very important. Um, and the second part of what I really want to accomplish with Clue is to help move science forward. I really think we need so much more information and science and research on this part of life. And now we can do it together with the scientists. Just very excited about that. So, um, I have no sense of time. How much time I have to go? You're, you're fine. Good. So, <laughs> um, I think this industry is really changing. When I started thinking about this in 2009, there was like one or two uh, period tracking apps in the App Store, the very first generation products. And it was like, who cared, right? And then my slashing came out at some point, say I'm going to do a period tracker. And suddenly it was kind of interesting, and now, three years down the line, it's much more interesting. I think the fact that we get this kind of media covers and we, you know, it's, there's a lot happening in this space of female health, and that's awesome. In fact, I would go so far as to say I really think there's kind of a social movement going on, or even revolution, about taking this whole field of reproductive health and female health and moving it out of taboo land and into something that's just another part of life. Um, and a very, very important part of that the kind of journey is to include the men. It's so important. Reproductive health is something that also happens between two people. And we find it again and again. Men, they want to understand what is going on with their loved ones. They want to, you know, why is she grumpy? <laughs> is she in pain? Like, are we, are we trying for a baby? Ooh, you got pregnant. Oh, no. Like, it's part of life, right? And we want to... And that's one of the cool things about having this digital tool is that you can facilitate a conversation with your partner or even maybe, you know, a mom and her daughter or a dad and her daughter. So I think that's, I really think we are part of this kind of global movement of change regarding this. Um, one of the things we have not done yet, but that I would love to get to, and we're doing very early prototype right now, is an SMS-based service. So the idea is that in developing markets where people don't have feature phones, people can still track and they can get information and they can get notification and we can collect data about this part of life. It could look something like this. So, Ida, um, globally, what percentage of women don't have access to smartphones or would, could only use SMS-based system? Any, any idea how many hundreds of millions that might be or billions? Yeah, we're probably up in the billions. It's, I mean... It's most of Africa, lots of Asia, lots of Latin America. It's a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, so I really truly think that we can have a, a really big global impact. And that's what I want to have. 
So this is my second last slide. And, um, and this is so I'm going to step a little out of clue world and into the more general entrepreneur world. I've been an entrepreneur, I was doing the math, 18 years. Hard to believe, but I've actually been an entrepreneur pretty much full time for 18 years. So I've learned a little bit. And in the end, I think when you're considering being an entrepreneur or even being an entrepreneur, I think there are really only two key questions. The first one is, what do I want to create? What is it that I'm so passionate about that I'll talk about it again and again and again and I'll go out and I'll find people and I'll raise money, I'll do all this stuff because I really care about it. What is it that you really, really want to create? That's the first question. And then the second question is, what price am I willing to pay for this? It might sound a little bit brutal, but I think there is a huge cost associated with doing anything great, I think. And, um, and being quite aware of like, you know, what am I willing to, what price am I willing to pay? Because I don't think you should be willing to pay any price, you know? You know, there's definitely ethics that you should think about. There's health, maybe. There is, you know, responsibilities you might have. I mean, for me, I think, you know, I've kind of accepted that in my life right now, there's pretty much two things. You know, there's my family and there's two. And then there's all the rest that you can imagine you could do in life, which I'm just not doing right now. And that's fine, at least you know, for a while. So, so that's one part of the price. And another part of the price is this emotional strain. It's really hard. I think there is this kind of this glossy image of what it is being an entrepreneur. It happened that I actually had coffee with Sheryl Sandberg today, which was pretty well. And I meet her, and I also meet this vulnerable person. And like, it, it's just hard. It's hard being an entrepreneur. I don't think it's for everybody. That's important to say. But this whole side of like, you know, emotional roller coasters and how am I performing and am I a good enough leader and like all these questions that keep coming and they keep changing, right? You have a new job every day. We have to also talk about that because otherwise we will not have healthy entrepreneurs, I think. So that's really important. Yeah, so the passion and the, and the strain. Yes, that was it. Thank you. Questions? I mean, I, I have a couple of questions. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Sonia. Uh, thank you for coming here today. I must admit, I've never heard of this app, although my husband said he had. <laughs> I wonder, uh, is this something that women can continue using after they stop having periods? Because you said it was for the moods and for the skin. Yeah. So, what I would love Clue to be, which is not yet, but the ambition is that it's, a, it's we can kind of take people by the hand from before they have the first period, and then throughout, you know, trying not to get per uh, pregnant, going through a pregnancy, going through menopause. And the thing is, our system kind of takes a lot of maintenance. <laughs> you know, people have cysts, they have, you know, diseases and conditions and all kind of thing going on all the time. We never figure it out. So I think it'll be a role to play for providing information and helping people be in touch with what's going on pretty much throughout. Yeah. Yes. Can you talk a bit about growth marketing? Because I imagine that you don't monetize a lot yet, so you can't be buying users at the same time. People don't brag about it on Facebook. So how do you yeah. get this kind of growth? It's a great question. Um, we do a lot of different things. Um, PR is definitely important. Um, we do some paid marketing, Facebook and other things. Um, we try to have people talk about us who other people listen to. Um, then we try to have good ranking in the app store, we try to get featured, like we do all these things that everybody does, I think. Um, I don't know if we have like a magic sauce somewhere, we have Guillaume on the team, who's really awesome. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, we. Um, let's see, might, we might have a little bit of a network effect with our sharing feature that's coming out soon, where people, you know, can bring more people on board. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's something that we constantly think about, you know, how can we, how can we get it e easier for people to find it and all of that. So let's be a little bit more specific. For example, 
Uh, do you have a growth hacking team? Do you use growth hacking techniques today yes. to build on viral growth? Yes. Are, are you doing data analytics? And yes, yes, okay. and yes, okay. and yes. And we try to make it stick it and habit forming and yeah, the full shebang. <laughs> we do everything we can. <laughs> okay, yes. Please. Hi, Ian. Yeah, Siri, I, thanks for it. was very interesting. Uh, do you um, find that you get backing or support from health personnel? I mean, I, I experienced that, that my daughters have actually been recommended to use that type of app yeah. um, by, by female health um, in the health, health care. I'm wondering, is that um, something you experience? And is, is there a difference between Europe and the US when it comes to that? I think it's still early for the doctors to really, like on a mass scale, recommend these tools, but it's definitely coming. And we also try to make it really easy for people to bring that information or that data to the doctor. Right now we do it in kind of a hacky way, it's kind of a print out, it's kind of a little old school. But I think it somewhat works, but we would love that to be super smooth. Because we have really great um, doctors, I'm, I'm winking up to when we have up here, um, doctors that we, we try to learn from to understand like what would be really helpful in the, in the practice. I think there's a lot of potential there. Because they can provide better, better care, right? Yes. Hi. Um, so I, you mentioned that you have part, you have scientific partnerships, including with Stanford. So I was wondering if you like aggregate the data that you get from your users and like make it anonymous and then transmit it further to labs. Or do you just like, do you have a mutual relationship with labs, or do you just learn from labs' current research without giving them the data? We do a little bit of all of it. Um, but the way these partnerships specifically have been set up is that they would go out and, or different for a different universe. Some of them would go out and say to a group of users, "Would you like to be part of this study? And could you please use Clue to collect the data?" And then we would give them that specific data set anonymized. Um, and other uh, universities, they would be specifically interested in bleeding patterns for adolescents, women, for instance. And we would then take that specific data set and then it's really kind of co-research. We are very like, we want to know, we want to learn and we want to make sure that it gets back to the users, right? It was their data, they should have, you know, the information and we try to be extremely transparent in like, how do we deal with data? People can opt out, they can, you know, you don't have to sign up anywhere. You can have all the data only on your phone. You can delete your data. So we, we try to be really respectful with that. Maria. What is the business model? We don't have one yet, and we don't care about it yet. Sorry, can you repeat your question? What is the business model? The business model, yeah. My, my basic assumption is that when you work in a field with something which is not a nice to have, but a need to have, it's relevant to pretty much 100% of the world's population, and it's emotional, and it's a space where people already spend money in a, you know, many different ways, it must be positive to build something that people think is so valuable that they want to pay for it. I want to find a business model that is for with the consumer. I don't want to do all kind of weird things that you don't know as a consumer. I think that's not what we want to do. We want to, you know, you open the app and you're like, oh, now I can also do this cool thing. Huh, it cost a little bit, okay, but I think it's worth it. Uh, just a que question, uh, sec. How much visibility are you getting in and around Berlin and? around Europe at this point. So is Berlin a, a location of heavy user adoption for Clue? What are your top two or three cities in Europe for, for users right now? Cities? Cities. Um, London. Um, Guillaume, actually, can you help me with that question? I think, yeah. Pretty much all the big cities in Europe. And in terms of different markets, uh, the US is our largest market, followed by the UK, Germany, Brazil and Mexico, yeah. And in U.S., you mean New York and West Coast, New York, San Francisco, Bay Area. It's U.S. as overall, but then you know you see you know, the big city, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, you talked about being able to share your findings to your partnerships with labs, ultimately for the user's benefit. Uh, how would you envision your relationship and any sort of oversight with medical professionals? Because obviously there's a real gap between scientific findings and how those can be presented in mass media. Yeah, so we do different things. First of all, we have a team with researchers, but they are researchers that can also help create information that is 
consumable for laymen, or whatever the term is. Um, so that's one thing. And then we also have a medical board um, where we try to work with people that can make sure that what we say is true. We have time for one more question. Yes. The major venture capitalists in Europe are based in Rome instead of Berlin. Did you find it jealous that you started based in Berlin to raise capital? You know what? In the end, you just get on a flight and you have conversations. I think um, in, for a good investor in London, it doesn't matter if you're in London or Berlin. For a good investor, investor here, it matters. For the investors we found in, in New York, they didn't care. So it's really down to that individual firm. Um, yeah. And where can people download your app from? In the App Store and in Google Play Store, and it's free, and I'm really you know, super curious to, to hear what you think of it. Okay, Ida, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Super, yes. I think we had a question. Yes, sir. I mean, um, can you talk about intellectual property in Macedonia, like protections of it? Because I think it's one thing to want to have those great businesses that form there, but then it's another to protect intellectual property. Can you speak for a minute about that? Um, Macedonia have a legal system for intellectual intellectual properties. And Irina is trained as a lawyer, as an attorney. <laughs> no, that was that was my, my first career. So um, we are we are also learning our startups in that in that field and in what what is the right moment to really seek for a legal and intellect protection of whatever they are they are doing. Uh, but what is not uh, present, let's say, in the moment, so much as a practice, is intellect is protecting this product on European on a global level. This not this is not so much a problem with not knowing the the, the, the systems, but moreover, this is a really expensive journey. So we're trying to protect what is uh, in uh, within Macedonia, and then for the one that are really uh, have valid business reasons why to do it out there to do it in other countries as well. But I want to point one thing. I'm, I, I don't believe strongly that every single product that we are developing should be protected. Uh, a lot of, we, in the, that early stage, we really uh, need to learn from each other's experiences and uh, uh, be confident that it's not that easy someone to steal your idea if they don't have the passion, if they don't have the reason, if they don't have the why to, do, to move it, to move it uh, forward. So, so we are up into a uh, stage where we are trying to be more flexible with that and then we introduce that option only what is really necessary. Ida, can you comment on intellectual property issues from the perspective of Clue? Because you're going into a lot of markets. Uh, you've got European patent office, European global patents, uh, which is coming in or is now mm -hmm. in place, US. How, how does this affect a small mm -hmm. team coming out of Berlin? Yeah, I mean, it's something that we speak about. Um, we have had some activities in the hardware space where that was felt more important. And we've been looking to see, you know, was there something on our algorithm side of things we could look at. But I think, I mean, honestly, like Irina says, you know, it's, it's not so easy to copy the whole thing. So I think we just try to go full steam and, and think that that's our best protection, that we are just out there, you know? Speed and user engagement yeah. and viral growth and design. And brand. Brand, absolutely. And quality, yeah. Yes, Lars. One more question. Um, sorry, as you get a little data, is that considered medical data in the European markets? So for instance, in the US, HIPAA would be a huge problem in ensuring privacy of data. Is that a problem for you as you internationalize? Um, it's not considered medical data at this point, um, but yes, we are very aware of where things are going. Um, yes, <laughs> I actually had a question from a from a um, journalist today, and she asked, like, should these kind of apps be more regulated? And I really didn't know what to answer. It's a really, really tough question, I think. Because on one hand, yes, you want to have good protection, but on the other hand, if nothing happens in this field, that's even worse for the consumer. So, you know, and it, it's, it's really hard doing something that's regulated, so, yeah. So, it, Irena, uh, Macedonia is not yet part of the European Union. 
Yes, it's not. Not yet. Um, Kosovo, Albania? No. Also not. So how do your companies deal with these privacy issues? Because you're not under EU privacy law. I mean, this is still a, an evolving area. But this is something, if you're trying to go global as a company, you really have to think about. So what kinds of discussions do your startups have coming out of Newman's and, and do you hear among startups and in the legal community, corporate community in Macedonia and you know, southeastern Europe around the privacy? The good part is that the bigger uh, law firms that are in Macedonia, and we have a lot of international companies that are providing legal, legal counsel in Macedonia, are dedicating, started to dedicating teams uh, in some cases, even because of uh, we approaching them with, with this issue, the dedicating teams to work with startups and to provide personalized services, services they were made for, for startups. But on the other side, Macedonia, because it is preparing to become a European country and it's already a candidate country. Whatever laws we're making, we're, we're adjusting it to European Union. So uh, it is something that is very familiar and very, very, very common in European Union. What is present is what is present over there. In the moment. Okay. Let's see. We have time for one or two. Yes, Natalie. I have a question to uh, Irina. First of all, thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. So, do you have any data or thoughts on uh, the long-term job creation, which could potentially result from your ecosystem being created? Um, Having, having, developing a startups within, within a small country can tremendously influence um, on the job growth, but not on any kind of job, but on the one jobs that are known as jobs with other, added value, with higher intellectual value, and then that will definitely lead to uh, creation of much much more uh, regular, regular jobs. But what's most important is keeping uh, at least some of the really talented people within the country, or even if they go outside to want to come back, to want to bring, bring this business here, because there is really advantages of running a business out of, out of Macedonia. And startups uh, on a European level are named as uh, the single future element that will be uh, a key factor in increasing employability. Ida, any final closing words? Oh, that's un unexpected. <laughs> um, start lots of businesses wherever you are. I mean, it's wonderful. We need it. It's okay. good. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you both Keep coming learning. all the way from Skopje and Berlin. We have a couple of oh. uh, souvenirs, memories of Stanford. Uh, let's <laughs> give them a real great hand of applause. Thank you.